My guest today is Mihai Tataran. Mihai, how are you today? How are you? Good, thanks. Hi, David. It's a long time no see. It's <laughs> yeah, been too long. Person. And I, yeah. I think about you often, you know, in my days when I used to travel a lot. Uh, you know, I've, I've, always, um, I've always been grateful to you because uh, there was a period when I was traveling internationally and speaking at conferences all over the world. And it all started when you invited me to IT camp. Oh, uh, gosh, eight years ago, I think. That was my I first. So. That was my first conference I spoke at outside of North America, and it it opened a lot of doors for me. So it was a pleasure for us, and it yeah, still is. Me as well. Yeah. <laughs> I hope to come back to to Cluj Napoca sometime. Oh, very soon, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, tell me, Mihai, uh, what do you do for a living? So um, I'm in IT, of course. Uh, I'm a software engineer by trade, um, and I started a company called Avelgo 16 years ago, almost. Mm -hmm. uh, where we do custom software development and cloud services consulting on Microsoft Azure. So my day-to-day -day job is split between being the general manager of the company, uh, talking to customers, so doing some kind of account management, but also consulting work. So that's what I do. It's, it's, it's very volatile if you want. It changes from quarter to quarter, from year to year. But I'm, um, you know, still and I, I will continue to be involved in in many of our um, strategic projects and your projects almost always involve azure is that correct almost yeah well we have two departments one of them is doing cloud consulting so that's always azure mm. uh, and ai on azure more recently the other department which is doing software not necessarily azure but some of them are uh, and it's growing yeah so a lot of azure Okay, I guess I eleven that years now. I know that you're an Azure guy. You're an Azure MVP for a long time, and uh, uh, you speak in, around the world on that topic. Uh, and you brought you brought up something to my Indeed. attention that I wasn't familiar with the the Microsoft Azure well architected framework. What is that? Uh, well, it's a very very well um, received set of guidelines. Um, I would qualify it from top down as a very good set of um, principles you want to look at when you uh, put yourself in the position of migrating an existing application, enterprise application to Azure, or you build one from scratch. So that would be the top down. Uh, it covers, I would say, everything uh, good enough uh, in terms of how you operate the app after you deployed it into Azure, after you moved it into Azure. And from bottom up, um, it's still well it's it's going towards becoming a good reference in terms of technology options to use for different scenarios but all in all it's a well received framework that we were desperately waiting for um, in, in the world of you know people migrating applications enterprise applications to azure um, we were kind of doing those things but without having this umbrella and set of frameworks uh, it's also a, a second, I would say, um, um, benefit of th this framework is the fact that we have a common language with our customers. So we just, you know, it's easier for us to refer them to a documentation which is coming from the vendor, from Microsoft, and saying, hey, this is what we're going to apply. We're experts on that. And there's no, you know, back and forth on why do you do that? Uh, we know how to do operations. We know how to do monitoring. We know how to do scaling. Um, well, this is the framework now. Okay. Uh, you said you've been waiting for it. When was it introduced? I'm not very, uh, I don't want to make a mistake, but quite recently, I would say around two years. Um, but with the pandemic, you know, we always miss a year in our life. Uh, I find myself uh, misestimating when things happen. Exactly. Actually, this happened last summer, and actually it happened <laughs> two summers ago. It's like I'm missing it. Could be something <laughs> like that. Um, now Microsoft is preparing for a new uh, for a new version, which is coming out in in a few months. Um, mm -hmm. And I had the the, the the chance to discuss with the guys, with the engineering team behind that. It's very interesting. So quite new as opposed to Azure Lifetime, if you want. Right. And Azure is what ten or twelve years old, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's um, Eleven, twelve. Uh, the um, uh, I'm looking at the the website right now, which uh, is at um, under docs.microsoft.com, uh, and um, it's it describes it as a, a set of guiding tenets that can be used to improve the quality of a workload. Um, are these are these mostly focused on developers, 
or infrastructure or deployment or all of the above? All of the above. Okay. All of the above. Yeah. Uh, so what are some of those tenants? Well, there are five, um, five categories. I mean, it's, you know, cost. That would be how to view costs in, in, in different ways, how to minimize costs. So cost control would be uh, another sub-segment over there. Um, there's in any order which comes to mind, there's uh, reliability. And there you have, you know, concepts like disaster recovery, concepts like backup, etc. So these are mostly governance and operational stuff. Right. No, not too much development here. But then you have performance and scalability. And there's already an intersection between all the roles that you'd have um, versus an, an app in Azure. So devs included. Um, and then there's security and automation or operational excellence, how it's called uh, in, in their terminology. Um, operational excellence meaning um, infrastructure as code, automating everything as much as possible, you know. Um, so it's, a, it's very comprehensive. Um, it covers everything. You know, just to give you a, a personal note, I mean, just a few days ago, we were talking to a, this potential customer of ours. Um, they're doing software for many years, 2,000 developers, etc. And we've seen their operations manual of how their app, well, it's a suite of enterprise applications, should look in Azure after they migrate. They're in the middle of migrating things from on-prem to Azure. Mm -hmm. And there's a, you know, a very interesting, a very good operations manual, but it's designed and thought of by people who are good at operating on-premises. Right. It doesn't have the lens of cloud. And that's the, 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 the first thing I pointed out. Hey, you know, it should be Azure specific, not only the technologies, but also the principles, the paradigms, uh, the roles which change. Uh, there are different ways to do stuff as opposed to what you are accustomed on premises. So it's pretty comprehensive, well architected framework, and it's immediately helpful because it covers everything you need to take care of uh, for a workload to run in Azure. Hmm, okay. Uh, so let's say you mentioned uh, cost and operational excellence and uh, performance and scaling. Perf performance and scalability. Uh, what else is there? I see here? Reliability. reliability. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and I think I said that was, that was security. And security. Are, those, those are the five. Those are the five pillars. Exactly. Um, uh, let's drill down into some of these things here. What's um, how, how does this framework help us improve reliability, for example? Okay, that's a very good question. So for, for me as an uh, as an Azure expert, first of all, it, it functions like a template which forces you to go through all the aspects of reliability. So you don't forget something, right? Okay. Um, then um, it also puts you into the context of what a, an application or a workload means in the cloud. I'll give you some examples here. Uh, let's say you are an ISV, uh, so you develop a solution, and you want to offer it in a multi-tenant environment. From reliability perspective, you have to, because you know the, the, the framework kind of guides you towards that, you have to decide between different types of customers in terms of non-functional requirements. Uh, for example, you might have, let's call them enterprise customers, which expect an RTO of one hour, but you have standard oh, customers. RTO is? is recovery time objective. So if it fails, if the app fails, it should be up and running within uh, an hour, right? right? Or whatever you want to promise them. And then you have standard uh, clients which don't have such expectations. Uh, so first of all, it forces you to think about those KPIs like RTO, RPO, which is recovery point objective, which is how old is the data uh, when I recovered? So how old is the back backup that I'm using to restore the data from? Right. Um, and it's always, uh, you can find it throughout in the spirit behind it. You can find also a recommendation, which is to balance out things like availability versus disaster recovery. Uh, one thing that I found very useful is when we talk to our customers is, hey, what if, you know, ideally every customer wants 100% availability, right? Gotcha. But there's a, uh, you know, beyond a certain point, there's too much investment for what you gain. gain. So, 
let's call it 99.95, could be enough for most of the customers if they have a very good disaster recovery procedure, which means an, a small RTO, a small RPO, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this framework really puts you into the position to consider all aspects and then to do trade-offs between them because you, you're an engineer in the end. Uh, you cannot have exceptional, you know, 99.99 uh, uptime and cost, very good cost, you know, because right. you have all the five pillars and you have to treat them simultaneously. So uh, if I'm understanding it correctly, this this framework doesn't give you the answers. It provides the no. questions to guide you to think yeah. about what the answers yeah. are for yeah. your organization. Because exactly. given an infinite amount of money, you could have infinite uptime. I suppose, exactly. Uh, uh, exactly. But no, no one has infinite amount of money. Uh, you know, you everybody yeah. has a cons is constrained by budgets and time and uh, even in, other in the beginning of the, that documentation, they suggest, hey, you have probably non-production environments where cost is paramount, um, scalability and performance are not. <laughs> right. But you have production environments where you have, you know, much more uh, bigger constraints around reliability, security, and cost should go up. All right, and is it, this is probably true of all these pillars here, that it provides the, uh, a framework for you to ask these questions of yourself mm -hmm. specifically to your organization. You know, what, mm -hmm. what, is, what are my reliability needs relative to the amount of resources that I'm willing to spend? Yes. Uh, let, let's, let's go into each other. Security is the next pillar I have on my list here. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, how does it address, how does this framework address security? So I'm not an expert on security myself, um, but what it, 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 it's helpful for me uh, out of this framework is the fact that it again puts you into a context of treating everything which has to be treated what we do usually with our customers we start with things like how do we know that we have good enough security so let's define some kpis okay. uh, one yeah. of, and kpi is uh key performance indicator some metrics which okay. define uh that that we are secure enough okay. uh, some of them can be uh, derived from different uh, standards, uh, industry-specific standards like ISO, PCI DSS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have to follow those, and then from there you can derive a few things. Some some others are, you know, it, it could be a secure score, which which is uh, present in Azure. Um, but you know, it again, it it forces you to have a holistic approach on what security is. Security provided by Azure. Uh, security, which has to be on your uh, area of responsibility, you know, beginning from the bottom layer up to the application data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all the things that you need to take care of. All right, uh, yeah, and um, we've already talked about costs a couple of times, but cost optimization is a, spe a specific pillar in here. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, is that more than the cross cutting concern? How do they? How does that become a pillar on its own? Um, I guess well, if that that would be my guess. My I'm not sure how they put it there as as such a, an important factor. But my guess is that one of the biggest challenges enterprises had, maybe still have, is managing cost. Uh, because as opposed to on premises where you have a, a capex, uh, uh, an initial investment, uh, you know exactly how much you spend, and you ha you know the lifetime of that uh, IT infrastructure, which is five years, seven years, etc. So you you know you control it from the beginning, whereas opposed to in, in the cloud, especially with you know uh, self service people being able to create their own resources, uh, there's always uh, the risk of people creating too many or too big, uh, or you know forgetting resources over there. So that's why uh, governance in general is paramount, but cost control is part of that uh, of that governance. So yeah, with all the customers that we meet, uh, especially the ones who has who have already started their cloud journey journey, so they already have applications running in Azure. One of the biggest issues they have they don't have control over cost. Sure. They might have good views over cost, but no mechanisms to bring it down or to have some constraints around around the cost. I see, and I'm looking at the documentation again, and there's actually a checklist here with specific recommendations, things like reviewing your yeah. underutilized resources and finding discounts, and uh, this this idea of scale in and scale out. Only you know deploy the servers as demand grows and undeploy them as they uh, <laughs> as demand shrinks. Things like that, and then there's very vague things like reevaluate design choices, which is yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's a lot of. 
you see that all over what architecture framework it has it's it's an umbrella which covers everything but not in every detail possible right it's improving uh, you mentioned uh, a template or you mentioned a checklist uh, there's also yeah. one which is um, something it's called well architected framework benchmark or something uh -huh. like that so um, well it's a bit you know it's long but that's one of the things that uh, we encourage our customers to do because that's a very good um, conversation opener so mm -hmm. when we say hey probably you're not you're not operating well in azure or probably you're doing it um, incompletely. I mean, you you are accustomed to how you were do, doing things on premises, and uh, we're sure you're an expert in that. But once you move to Azure, probably you're forgetting stuff, and they don't really trust us, especially IT people who are very good or are experts. But once they go through the benchmark, <laughs> there are lots lots of questions over there, and most of the time they answer no to many questions, right? Mm -hmm. Um, do you have mechanisms to control uh, who has access to which resources? Okay, we don't, right? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a very good uh, conversation starter. Um, and we use, the, uh, we use it, we also have as a company, we have an advanced specialization on Azure. That's one of the ways uh, of Microsoft to differentiate between the partners they recommend to different customers. And um, we use templates from, uh, from the frameworks here and uh, they're quite good. Okay, uh, well, let's move on to the uh, the next pillar, operational excellence. And if I understand this correctly, this is more about uh, the ongoing operation of your Azure. Once the application's in place, how do we make sure it's running exactly. properly and adjust accordingly? Exactly. So first of all, I have to comment this, but the, the, the biggest value that I've seen with this pillar as a software engineer myself, as, as a developer by trade, is that, you know, software developers don't really think about how the applications are going to be operated once they deploy in production. They don't care about that. Uh, this pillar kind of forces you to go through that. I mean, I okay, how easy it is to update? How easy, how easy will it be to do a new version? Um, do I design a monolithic application or do I design uh, microservices architectures? Right, this, th those kind of questions could reside out, out of the, the documentation, but mostly is, is about how do I operate efficiently? And that's basically a combination of CI-CD. Uh, I would call them modern CI-CD, so be able that's to deploy. Continuous int integration and continuous deployment. Yeah, thank you. Um, so be able to deploy uh, parts of the application, which is microservices. That's a very good uh, aspect here. Um, then um, automating everything related to deployments, failovers, backups, all the operational stuff that you know you have to do recurrently. Um, and then, uh, you know, it can go up to, you know, testing, automation testing, load testing, stuff like that. So that's all, all that you are going to do uh, on a continuous basis, automate that. And most importantly, make sure that uh, you have infrastructure as code. That's one of the recommendations that you you, you find there. So mm. describe the environment, describe the application, the data, all all of that, as much as possible in uh, infrastructure as code. I would think that um, also is when you're talking about the ongoing operation of an application, that monitoring and instrumentation would be key to this. Exactly, they're they're part of that as well, right? So, um, and again, monitoring. Uh, has some specific things in Azure, right? People we, we uh, encounter in, in the, usually we have customers which are quite large enterprises. They have very good operations teams, but they're accustomed to do monitoring in a certain way. In Azure, you have other tools, you have other principles maybe, um, and that's also part of uh, operational excellence, uh, or how it's called in, in uh, one architecture framework. Oh, this is good. We've been through three of the pillars. I, the fourth one I have <laughs> on my list is performance efficiency. Uh, and we yeah. touched on this. This is a little bit of, uh, you know, about meeting the demand uh, as, a, as a change. Yeah, yeah. My, my translation in my mind is I always think about it as performance and scaling <laughs> right. because it's also about scalability. They're kind of interrelated. Yeah, um, that's also as, as a developer with a development background, um, you know, in, in the past, developers would design the app and, and just deploy it on the server that they had, right? Uh, if you need more performance, you just you just increase the server capacity. Um, that's not 
<laughs> it's not very agile. It's not very right. um, efficient. Yeah. And Buy, buying a new CPU takes time and takes time, uh, and it's not uh, it's not cheap. <laughs> and again, you know, uh, I would look at well architected framework as a very good guide, uh, starting from our conversations from, uh, hey, why do we want to move this application to Azure? Do we just want to get out of an existing data center because the contract is expiring? Well, then some of the aspects here are not very relevant because we just want to move fast. We have to have the operations ready, right? But not optimize everything. Uh, on the other side, when you say, yeah, I want to go to the cloud because I want shorter time to market. I want to be able to deliver faster and I want to deliver, you know, um, as fast as I want to, to be able to, to increase the, the resources as fast as possible to respond to demand, that scalability. Well, then this pillar becomes extremely relevant. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that uh, that seems like a very broad category. The efficiency. It is. So th it I think is. we covered we covered we covered liability, security, cost opposition, operational excellence, and performance efficiency. That's the five pillars. Um, is this? And I and I I would I'll put in the show notes this. Uh, uh, architecture the architect well architected framework documentation that i'm looking at right now uh, is um is there anything that we should cover that we well, have not, not necessarily well maybe some comments here i would add yeah. um the documentation has increased or, or, or I, I, I didn't follow it exactly from the you know every day but yeah. it it went towards having specific workloads recommendations so you're going to find under well architected framework a, a section an area which is technology specific, uh, like compute, and then you have uh, a lot of recommendations, architectural recommendations around containers, AKS, stuff like that. So, and that's that's in my opinion an area where we need more to be improved. I know this is a new edition coming. We're going to see what what it brings. Hmm. Uh, there are many many options to host microservices in Azure, to host containers in Azure. Hmm. Uh, it's great getting there. Um, it's going to be a, a very, very comprehensive set of not only prin architectural principles like the ones that we just talked about, but also uh, decision trees, if you want, uh, navigating between technology choices. Yeah, and I think it also lists a, a set of tools in here below this, like the uh, uh, well architected review and the mm -hmm. Azure Advisor, and, and of course the documentation. Are mm -hmm. you are you uh, following those or sending those to your customer? Or yeah. Have you so the something? review or the assessment, in my mind, I, I think is the same thing. Uh, I was referring to exactly that. Got it. Uh, that's one of the things that we we do, and uh, you know the homepage of the documentation. So they have the same language as we do. Uh, many of our customers, I have to say, are have their own IT department, right? So they have some kind of, you know, people who are specialized or beginning to be specialized on Azure. So um, that's why we have to have a common knowledge, common uh, language. Um, are, are there any specific tools that you use when you're implementing this with your customers? Uh, not Nothing related to well architected framework, except for the right. documentation and templates. Got it. Uh, it's just the tools that we use with Azure. Is there any reason that you would have a customer that's uh, either migrating to Azure or uh, or building a, a greenfield application that they would not use the well-architected framework? Um, I cannot think of a good reason except for uh, when they're extremely um, in a rush. They, they have to do it fast. Yeah. And then I mean, a lift and be, shift is probably more appropriate. In that yeah, case. There, there, there might be reasons for doing that, and we have encountered some. And then you know, uh, leave it for later. Okay. But you should come back to it. Um, I mean, that's that's the general recommendation. So the answer is eventually this framework is appropriate to anyone that's building an application on that. I would say so. If the application is critical, is good enough, is important enough. If if it's not a sandbox, if it's not a playground for developers to test a POC to do, you know. But if it's a production workload, then it should should be. Well, I guess. I guess that's a fair assessment. Like my blog is hosted on Azure, and I don't really mm -hmm. put much thought into it. I didn't uh, think about. Yeah. You know, maybe someday I'll think of the scalability issue, but <laughs> you know, I'm not <laughs> nearly popular enough Hopefully. for that. <laughs> uh, that's so, a good one. so, so maybe the very maybe uh, any enterprise application uh, would be appropriate for this. For sure, for sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, well. This has been great, Mihai. I really appreciate you taking the time. I, I, as I said, I really want to get back to Cluj 
uh, sometime in the near <laughs> in the near future. <laughs> yeah, I'm also <laughs> looking forward to going to the US. There. Uh, beautiful oh, country, yeah. beautiful people. What's what's next for you? Are you still doing any public speaking? Uh, yeah, I am. I mean, I just started again after you know some online conferences still uh, lined yeah. up. I was recently uh, very much involved with the friends, the, the local friends of the uh, of the uh, hometown, my hometown uh, community. For example, doing um, uh, technology courses or workshops with students, high school students. I did a uh, introduction in AI for high school students for like uh, one week, two hours a day. Oh, nice! Ninety students came. Ninety high school students came. It was amazing. Uh, before that, I did a workshop on cloud and AI with all their teachers. So, I don't know, I had 45, 50 uh, IT teachers, high school teachers from uh, from my county. And that was very cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I forgot that you're actually not in Cluj. You're in uh, I Timisoara, don't live in right? Timisoara? Exactly. Okay, yes. yeah, yeah, because I only see you in Cluj. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, or in Seattle. <laughs> or in Seattle, exactly. And online as well. And online. Mihai, thank you so much. Thanks, you David. Stay safe. Thanks very much. Yeah, David, it's been a great interview. We've been friends for many, many, many years. I do remember the first thing, um, which uh, was a conference in the US where technology brought us together. Uh, it's been great. Uh, looking forward to meet you again. Thanks so much.